So in this week's videos, we're going to be talking about summary, paraphrase, and quotation, and other um, source handling skills that you want to be developing as you finish up your bibliography and prepare to write your actual paper. So let's start with some definitions of summary, paraphrase, and quotation. So summary is a brief overview of the contents of the text or the passage. Um, it's basically what you're writing in your annotations for your annotated bibliography. It's the big picture and depending on your genre, you may want to use more or less of the summary. Um, when you summarize, you still need to have an attribution of some kind, some kind of a citation, but it's important to note that a lot of times in a summary, the attribution is built into the summary, and we'll look at some examples later of that. But even if it's not a formal citation, you still need some kind of an attribution so that your reader knows it's a summary. Now, a paraphrase is actually kind of more like a summary than you think it is. Um, it takes a specific passage and it restates it in a different way and it interprets the passage in the process because anytime you translate something that's also an act of interpretation so it uses your words not the authors you can use some quotations inside of a paraphrase just like you can use quotations inside of a summary and the goal of the paraphrase is not just to be like, well, I don't feel like we're having a quotation here. It's always some kind of a rhetorical goal. Uh, it may be that your audience might not be um, familiar with the terms or the style of the original passage, and so you need to translate it for them. Or it might be because it doesn't fit into your uh, text for some reason. A lot of times there's a passage you want to use, but oh my gosh, that passage is just poorly constructed for what's going on. And that's a time to use paraphrase. Um, so this is something to use when the exact words are not important, but you need to convey that passage all the same. Now a quotation, this is probably the most obvious thing. It's an exact word or phrase or sentence from a passage or a text, you mark it with quotation marks. If there is a quotation inside of the quotation that you're looking at, then you use single quotation marks where their quotation marks are. Uh, we can look at some examples of that later as well. Um, quotations should be brief. You want to avoid using really long quotations. When you do use a really long quotation, you use what's called a block quote, where instead of quotation marks, you use an indent. But you really kind of want to just avoid doing that as much as possible, depending on your genre. Um, and quotations are used when the exact phrase or the precise structure of the sentence is really important. So it might be that phrase is really poignant. It might be that you intend to use that phrase as something uh, important later. Um, it might be that you are analyzing the words themselves. There's a lot of reasons to use quotations, but the most important thing is you don't quote for quote's sake. That means that you don't put a quotation mark or put a quotation in just because you're like, I need a quote. That's not going to work. You use a quotation because it's somehow important. Um, you aren't just showing off, hey, I've got quotations. Don't do that. It's obvious when it happens and it's really annoying. So always think about why are you including those specific words. So here's some um, So in all of these examples, I'm using the same text, um, just a, a book that I've read before. Um, so this is a summary. It says, in his 2006 book, Dave Barry's Money Secrets, humorist Dave Barry parodies popular financial self-help books while criticizing the genre for misleading readers. In particular, he notes that the current American monetary system depends heavily on consumer faith, and he makes particularly prescient attacks on Donald Trump's financial advice book, How to Get Rich, as an example of the problems with the financial self-help genre. So this is a summary that you might use in your annotated bibliography if you were using this source, which I imagine you're not, but this is what a summary might look like in your 
annotation, annotated bibliography. So this could be an annotation for that. Um, note that I'm still giving attribution. We know that this is talking about Dave Barry uh, and his book Money Secrets. Um, and there isn't a parenthetical citation involved though because we've got all that information in the text already. The tone is very explanatory and we're covering the big picture, but we're also importantly covering things that we think will be relevant to our audience about that text or relevant to our argument. Um, so that's how a summary works. So not only could this appear in your annotated bibliography, it might appear anywhere in a research paper when you're introducing a source or an idea you might use a summary to do that. A paraphrase is a little more direct as we talked about. So in this one we've got according to Dave Barry the American monetary system is a quote Tinkerbell system because it depends not on gold or silver but entirely on people's faith in the money. Now notice that in this paraphrase we did use a quote the Tinkerbell system uh, which is a direct quote from the passage. Um, the reason we need that is because that's a technical term as we're using it. Um, but otherwise, part of the purpose of this paraphrase is that to get that information out of the original text, you had to read like two paragraphs and the structure was in a very flippant tone and so it, it wasn't really appropriate for the style that we were going for. Um, as you can see in the quoted passage below here, you could understand why we might want to change that tone if we want it to fit into, say, an academic paper. And here we have an actual quotation. Dave Barry argues that our money is only valuable, quote, because we all believe it's valuable, end quote because, quote, we see everybody else running around after these pieces of paper and we figure, hey, those pieces of paper must be valuable, end quote. Notice the parenthetical citation here and notice that we didn't have to put the author's name in the parenthetical citation because it's already in the introductory phrase we used for the quote. So make sure that you do use some kind of an introductory phrase most of the time. Uh, otherwise, it's called a dropped quote. And uh, notice that we didn't quote the entire sentence or even the entire passage. We just quoted the very most important parts. Um, so even if I'm reading aloud, we should know that it's a quotation. So the state barrier use that tells us we're quoting. So here's some passages, or a passage with sources. Um, so in this passage, we have a dropped quote. We start with a dropped quote. Genre, as redefined in rhetoric, composition, in complex and myriad ways, is defined by its situation and function at a social context. Debit 698. And then our author knows that there's something wrong here because they then have to go back and point to the quote to explain it. They say this quote by A.B. Debit shows how complicated defining genre can be, but this definition doesn't take into account the way that people talk about genre in popular culture because genre usually means a formula. So it's self-referential. The I say and they say moves are not entirely clear um, in part because of this dropped quote. So by starting with this dropped quote, we've actually built a lot of problems in. So our writer can revise this by using clearer they say I say moves. When Amy Devitt notes that genre as redefined in rhetoric composition is defined by its situation and function in a social context, she, like many scholars in rhetoric and composition, fails to take into account the way that genre is understood by most people. But if we are to understand genre, we must also account for the popular use of the term, which is to refer to and categorize formulaic works. So here we have this, if we do this, we do that, that's a I say move. Um, but we also have this, they say move with Amy Devitt notes, but in, it's embedded into an I say move where we're criticizing Devitt for failing to take into account popular definitions. Notice that, again, we've only used what we need, and 
even if we're reading it out loud, you kind of understand where the quotations are. So this is a way to what we call couch a quote, which is to put it into a context that helps your reader understand what's going on and why you needed that quotation. So how does this have to do with genre? This is labeled as a focus video. So source family conventions are genre and audience specific. So you don't use a parenthetical citation in a popular text. You might use a footnote instead. Um, also, if you're choosing to use APA or MLA style, one thing to consider is that there's typically a different writing style associated with those. Uh, APA tends to use more paraphrase and summary, where MLA uses more quotations. And this is partly because APA is expected to have a more objective sounding tone, a more scientific sounding tone, where MLA has a more personal tone. Um, it's also a difference in what kind of evidence is acceptable. So pay attention to your genre and your audience as you decide how you're going to quote, paraphrase, and summarize. Um, even though in a lot of popular genres the citation rules might not apply, a lot of the source handling guidelines still do. And one thing that I'd like you to actually think about is how do allusions work in artistic works? So an allusion doesn't have a citation, but the audience is still expected to understand that that is source material that is not original to the text. And then other things to consider when you're doing source handling that are genre specific. In academic genres, we use present tense when discussing what sources say. So even though that article was written 50 years ago, we still use the present tense to talk about it because it still says what it says. Um, we also use last names to refer to people. So depending on what kind of publication you're using, people may or may not use titles. In academic writing, we almost never use titles. There are a few field specific exceptions, but generally I don't wanna see Mrs. Smith or something like that. I just want to say Smith. Um, so look at the examples here. It's um, it's not necessary to put doctor when you're writing about uh, people with PhDs writing scholarly articles because frankly most people writing those scholarly articles have that title. Um, and what's important is what they say, not who they are necessarily. Um, as far as whether you use the full first name or an abbreviated form or something, that's going to be dependent on the style manual you're using. So also be brief with as much introduction as you use. Um, in most cases, only the name is sufficient. Um, in some cases, you'll need to explain that it's in a such and such article or that it's uh, whatever their role is that makes them qualified to speak on that. But when in doubt, just put the name in. So that's some basic source handling stuff. Uh, in the next video, we'll talk some more about some source handling techniques.